You're probably wondering why a billionaire scientist works in the back room of a planetarium. The thought had crossed my mind. Well, I find it peaceful. Besides, I own the building. Hello and welcome to part two of the Unsourced World Smallville Retrospective, which means that we're heading right into season two, which premiered in 2002 on WB. But first, let's backtrack a bit because there's a lot of things I wasn't able to really cover in my video on season one that are really important in season two. Don't blame me, there was a lot to cover, even in 23 minutes. First, Lex is dealing with the alien spaceship. Near the end of season one, Lex starts to uncover the mystery of what really happened during the meteor shower, and he gets the help of a tabloid journalist named Roger Nixon to track things down for him. There's a story here in Smallville, and I am going to make my name on it. I found a man who had a very interesting view of the meteor shower. Claims he saw something fall out of the sky. Doesn't sound like a meteor. <laughs> I know air aircraft better than most. The way that thing moved, it had to be ship. And then he later hires a Dr. Hamilton to help make sense of it. I should state that he's not the Dr. Hamilton from the comics in the first of many narrative tricks that Gotham would eventually copy from Smallville. It's someone entirely different with the same name. Although he fulfills more of a Dabney Donovan role, being Lex's scientific patsy. But all three end up finding out about the Kryptonian key that unlocks the spaceship. There is nothing like this alloy on this earth. It's this key that Nixon later ends up stealing, placing into the spaceship, and then recording in order to become rich and famous. And it's him who Pa chased into the tornado to stop. Three things! I will not let him destroy this family! Second, Clark and Chloe actually got together, like they did. He realizes that Lana is a bit of a long shot and decides that him and Chloe make a good pairing. And he even makes his move and asks her out. But Chloe, I'm sorry I didn't ask soon. It's okay. It was worth the wait. That's important because for as long as the show liked to milk the love triangle, even in this season, the show denying them even a single kiss last season was basically the nail in the coffin. Excuse me for a second. Yeah. Can I have everyone's attention, please? Uh, thank you. The National Weather Service has just issued a tornado warning. Apparently three funnels have been spotted heading towards Smallville. And now, we can start season two. And now, the season premiere of Smallville. And that's the last time we hear that voice. Every other season premiere has a character say it, and that's less awkward. Unlike season one, there is slightly more of a defined arc for season two, which is that everyone is trying to get their hands on the spaceship. No one even knows what it's about, and it takes until the last few episodes of this season for anyone to figure out what the word Krypton even means, but it's the big through line. Clark's quest to figure out who he is, or what he is, and everyone else's obsession over it. Even Lionel gets in the direct line of fire here, after spending season 1 on the sidelines, with this insane scheme he has. What threads from last season remain are only heightened in this one. Like Lex's growing mania concerning the ancient alien style history that Smuggle has, including Native American cave drawings on the outskirts of the town, there are nothing but gags and foreshadowing, which is just really awkward. But benefit of the doubt, I believe this was a direct reference to John Ostrander and Timothy Truman's Max series The Kents, which was about Pa Kent's grandfather and great uncle, where a Native American blanket somehow has the House of El Sigil on it. There's even talk about how Superman is a Native American messianic prophecy in both of these. It's the legend of Numan. My ancestors have passed down this story for generations. It was prophesied that Naman would fall from the skies in a rain of fire. They say that Naman will have the strength of ten men and will be able to start fires with his eyes. Who's that? It's the woman he's destined to be with. That last bit about Clark's true love wearing that bracelet never comes back around, even after Lois shows up. Oh, and Lex ends up hiring another insane scientist, because one just wasn't enough. One drawback about this is that it does lead to Lex becoming more of a second-rate character, less involved with the core arcs, and kind of sidelined, which is a shame. On the other hand, this means that Pete gets a lot more to do this season, much more than I expected given the handful of lines he had last time, becoming Clark's closest side character friend after being the first character to actually find the spaceship, and thus learn Clark's secret. In an episode which sees Dr. Hamilton going insane, from a fatal case of Tony Todd style kryptonite poisoning. Except it's played a lot less seriously this time. The doctors don't even have a name for what's killing me! Are you dying? Yes. But not before I prove I am not some sideshow freak, a quack doctor who sells media rocks on the side of the road. And if you don't tell me what I want to know, then you're dying too! Pete ends up joining Clark in pretty much all of his adventures this season, 
including a weird one where he has to help Clark cheat on a DNA test. But other than my scintillating conversational skills, I still don't understand why you brought me along. I need your spit. It's a really nice way to give Pete more dimension than last season, where he had basically no impact, but because of the weight it places on his trust in Clark and on their friendship. I even met an alien. Really? Mm -hmm. Would you like to describe it? Actually, he looks a lot like Clark. I thought aliens were little and green. I guess things aren't always what you think they are. Yet it's that weight that gives it more meaning and impact. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. So it's a great evolution from the first season, which was very episodic and a strict formula, to something that's a bit more serialized. There's more stakes at play here. Lionel in particular has several power plays that keep the drama pretty intense, from spying on Lex to ruin his life, to bribing an increasingly rejected feeling Chloe to spy on Clark for him, and also pretending to be blind in order to keep everyone from suspecting. It's basically the show trying to have a proper Lex Luthor figure in order to keep Lex himself sympathetic and reasonable, like having him save Pa Kim Slight from Roger Nixon. Lionel also develops the first hints of his fun but overly exaggerated crush on Ma Kent. I had no idea Martha Kent had such keen business acumen. I wonder if your talents aren't being wasted on organic produce. I'm going to take that as a compliment. You should. While it defines his character later on, he gets a whole subplot this season when the Smallville Sheriff tries to frame Pa Kent for an attempted crime of passion over it. Speaking of Chloe, I thought her turn this season with joining forces with Lionel to be a really entertaining way of maintaining her role because with her embarrassing rejection by Clark. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, our friendship is so important to me. Uh, the last thing I want to do is screw it up. Good. Great. Perfect. I'm really glad we got that straightened out. And generally being cut out of the loop once Pete learns his secret. Okay, what's up with him? Yeah, it's just guy stuff. It gives her something to do. Unfortunately, it does have shades of a really lame woman scorn cliche. But it does lead to fun things in later seasons. What distinguishes this season is that it fully accepts that it's a Silver Age show, like actual Superboy comics. Season 1 tried to do a whole Buffy thing with episodes as allegory for high school. But season 2 decides to be as campy as possible, from the aforementioned awkwardness of using Native American legends like the Skinwalker, to introducing murderous clones, a Jekyll and Hyde monster who hulks out when he sees the sun, a multiple man who uses his powers to get good grains and date two girls at once, and I told you we weren't done with Chloe's evil boyfriends. And even a villain that has nothing to do with kryptonite radiation and just seems to be an evil witch that steals people's youth to stay young forever. And again, they go back to witches later, because this show doesn't forget anything. Hell, even that whole episode of Clark's Native American world girlfriend has shades of Laurel Lamaris, being a love interest for Clark who has powers of her own, and they're bonding over it. The show jumps in with both feet and even introduces color kryptonite, starting with red. And it is delightful. I think she looks really hot, and I think that your dress code sucks. Excuse me? Besides, I don't think you should be the one giving fashion tips. Tom Willing shows off his chops by playing a wonderfully douchey Clark. Did you know when you get all serious, your nose crinkles up? It's really sexy. Clark, when did you and the money truck hook up? Since I decided there's no percentage in playing poverty. And this time I think Raimi's Spider-Man copied Smallville. The show has about five different Ray K episodes, and they're some of the best ones. She's giving her a ride to school. Say the word and I'll save you the return trip. This season wastes no time in giving us two right off the bat. In your world, green means stop. In red, red means go. That isn't to say the show has lost a backbone in season one. If anything, it goes even harder. Clark still has to deal with issues that just can't be solved. Ryan, the abused kitty befriended, comes back for an episode, and it turns out he has a brain tumor, and he dies. Thanks, Clark. For what? This moment is perfect. I don't want you to be angry or sad. You changed my life. 
You're gonna change a lot of people's lives, Clark. Promise me you'll never give up. I promise. It's so damn heartbreaking, and yet it's something that Clark has to deal with and accept. Lex this time even gets through to Ryan a bit, so it's a tragedy all around. I have two copies of every issue, one for the collection and one for reading. Why do you like Warrior Angel so much? Helped me through some tough times when I was younger. There's another episode where Clark is led to believe that he seriously injured someone with his power because he wasn't careful. And while this turns out to be fraud, he still has to come to the grips of the fact that he might be dangerous. Son, I got into a lot of fights when I was your age too, believe me. But Clark, these are not alien feelings. What you have to remember under these circumstances is that there are consequences. Your father's right. You'll make decisions in a split second you have to live with for the rest of your life. And of course, the biggest thing to show are pulls, which is going to need some background. Alright, so Ma Kent is infertile, upstyle. Let's get that out of the way. Last season, she got blasted by a white light from the activated spaceship and is later healed by it. Turns out all of that was orchestrated by a jor AI that exists in the ship to help her conceive of a child of her own. Because he's come back to take Clark and make him a true Kryptonian. You will return to me. Your destiny will be fulfilled. It's basically the plot of Brightburn, but the main character is actually Superman. Naturally, Clark doesn't want to leave his family behind and things that are actually happening with Lana. So he rebels and uses a kryptonite copy of the key made by Lionel to destroy the ship, which causes a sonic boom that ends up hurting Ma Kent in a car crash and causes her to miscarry. And it's genuinely awful. Like you would think this would be on the level of loss, right? A team so about Superman having this in an episode. But it's just so sorrowfully and heart-wrenchingly played that it feels earned and impactful. I didn't have a choice, Dad. I had to destroy the ship. Why didn't you tell us? I knew you wouldn't agree with what I did. Dad, I didn't want it to take me away from you. I'm so sorry for what I did. Your actions have consequences, Clark. Didn't your mother and I ever teach you that? Yes. But there's no time for excuses, Clark. It's too late. You didn't think this thing through. You had no idea what was going to happen. And, and so Clark, in a bout of self-destructiveness, takes some drug allegory Red K and runs off to Metropolis. Which is a better cliffhanger than a CGR tornado for sure, because you're left hanging emotionally and it's much more worthwhile to invest in it. At least, I thought so. So what I'm trying to say is that this season definitely had some higher highs than season 1, but season 1 was more consistent while season 2 was a bit more over the place. For as engaging and enthralling as it can be, it'll have episodes like Lana having her own fan on the opera ripoff plot where a monster writes her poems, or an episode straight out of Days of Our Lives with Lex's super secret half-brother who blackmails him and is never talked about again. And that's why it's not my favorite. Now let's dedicate some time to a few notable mentions that I desperately need to talk about. First, yes, this is the season with the introduction of Heat Vision. This needed its own section because it's the most amazing episode of any superhero show ever. It's basically a giant metaphor for getting embarrassing public erections. And it's one of the most heartwarming podcast episodes too because of how he tries to help Clark control his urges, and even he knows it's funny as hell. <laughs> Second, this is where we get the official torch pass between Tom Welling and Christopher Reeve, and they don't waste a second of it. Only through communication will people live in peace. Sounds like a remarkable guy. He was until he pulled a J.D. Salinger, sold his company, and put his millions toward charitable foundation. What I love about how they use Reeve in this season is that it's beyond stunt casting. It's an actual role that has real impact on the characters. Hello, Clark. I've been expecting you. He's the one man on Earth who has figured everything out about Krypton, and he's there to relay it to Clark. And yet, he does so in his oddly clinical yet warm way. It's eerie, but comforting at the same time, which I guess is Reeves' magic. 
This is Kalel of Krypton, our infant son, our last hope. Please protect him and deliver him from evil. The big reveal he brings is the one thing that basically no one knew yet, that Krypton was destroyed. It's tragic, and it puts Willing on a spot to confront a truly existential crisis. Is that where Krypton is? No, that's where Krypton was. Well, I can't be the only one. There must be others like me. There is only one message. What better use of Reeve than to bring this one missing piece to Superman's character? You won't find the answers by looking to the stars. It's a journey you'll have to take by looking inside yourself. You must write your own destiny, kal -El. Reeve was only able to make one or two guest spots before his unfortunate passing, but each time the show had a special ad for his charity foundation about how people could support the cause. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Please. Please call. <laughs> I got something myself from that website after finishing this rewatch. Oh, and we also got Terrence Stamp as Jor-El, which was also pretty great casting. A bit stunty, sure. But this series' version of Jor-El was a cruel piece of shit, and that worked out working in its advantage. This is the mark of your ancestors. You cannot fight it, Kyle. At the zenith of the star Sol, you will begin your journey. And it brings some sharper relief as to why the Kents are necessary and important to Clark's development. And lastly, I want to give some special spotlight to Whitney's character. Because, well, even though last season he and Lana reaffirmed their love for each other, he's still serving overseas, and sometimes things just don't work out. And she ends up sending him a Dear John letter. Whitney, I care about you very much. And I always will. Whitney's later killed in action, which causes her an insane amount of guilt, because it's not as though she doesn't love him, but now she has to fear that he died thinking she didn't. Don't do that to yourself. He was missing in action, fighting for his life thinking that I wasn't there, that I didn't care. Although, fun fact, a concurrent Titan comic revealed that he understood, but it's still kind of tragic because he died before he could send a letter saying he understood. Oh, and this is the episode where the shapeshifter returns, pretending to be Whitney because she's in love with Lana. It's a weird episode, but it's a welcome one because it's kind of the only really good thread Lana gets this season. The rest of her screen time is monopolized with her terrible relationship with Clark being developed more, and a random thread about finding her secret real dad that goes nowhere. It just all feels forced, so having this one beat to deal with by yourself just felt genuine. Whitney's mom just called. He's missing in action. <laughs> So yeah, rest in peace, man. You will be missed. Another fun fact, the actor Eric Johnson would be on a Flash Gordon show for the Sci-Fi Channel. Flash! I so did not see that. And I might talk about that later because it rips off Smallville heavily. Oh, and Lex fell in love, got married, and then got left for dead by his wife. Twice. He did not have a good time this season. And two more things, they'll be quick. First, whoever made this cover for this issue of Warrior Angel is a genius because, yes, sometimes a hero does cry. And lastly, this is the season where the music reaches its peak, where we actually have some cross promotion with Smallville's The Talon Mix. Check it out. It's the latest Talon Mix. And yes, that is a piece of merchandise you could have bought at any retail store, and I wish I had a copy. Anyway, that's it for season two of A Smallville. Here's my scorecard. As always, I'm so glad you listened. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, and hope to see you again next time. Have a great one.